everybody, welcome to another edition of PD and P-Dubs Unscripted here. P-Dubs, how's it going? Hey, it's going great, PD. Welcome, everyone, to Faith Intersections, and we're so glad to be here with you on another awesome episode uh, about faith intersecting with our culture. So, uh, yeah, things going really good, and uh, baseball is underway, and uh, really exciting. Both of our teams are doing well. Right, as time of recording, both teams are three and one. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, even uh, with a three and one record, there's some challenges. You guys are having challenges with some injuries. The injury and, bug. Yep, and uh, so far so good on that with the Cubs. Not too many, you know, injuries and such, but uh, already a bench clearing kind of. You know, discussion, we'll say, with well, aren't the Brewers. Isn't it kind of the Christian thing to turn the other cheek? So, you know, I don't know if the no, Cubs are... No, I, I think it's like, I, I think biblically, Pastor, it's come, let us come together and reason together, you know? Oh. So I think that's why Jay Hay was running so quickly from center field. He wanted to come together and reason with one another. I think Jay Hay needs to be kicked out of baseball, (laughs) running all the way from center field for that brouhaha. He he was just wanting to, you know, have no misunderstandings, you know. So he just wanted to make sure, as a leader of that team, that it didn't get out of control. Well, maybe he can lead by hitting the ball, actually, and play for hits. Hey, I think I saw he's hitting, like, 300 or something wow. already. Yeah, I mean, like, Whoa. this is, like, this is the year, baby. <laughs> and, and Ian Happ's hitting 700. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, your mean Mercedes hit, like, 800 for a month last year. Look how that turned out. I know, yeah. Oh, boy, the tale of two seasons, huh? So, so yeah, uh, the Sox, you know, we got Tim Anderson back from suspension, so that he... Yeah, that bad boy. That's a spark bad, plug. Bad, Tim. He's a spark he's plug. He's a bad man. Wow. Just did a bad thing well, in the he's playoffs He's a bad, bad man year. the way he hits that ball. Well, yeah, he gets your offense generated, that's he, for he, sure. He does. Like, you know, the first game back, they scored 10 runs, I think. Mm-hmm. And he had three hits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. some uh, some interesting stuff going on with your team, especially around A.J. Pollock, you know, and that controversial ending of a game. But I got to mm-hmm. give it to him. He had... He had like the athleticism to come up with that catch. It was, and I, you know, first comes, I was like, "That a boy, let's go, let's go, extra innings, we got this." And then I saw the replay, I was like, yeah. well, "I was trying myself, so I'm like, it didn't really hit, it didn't really hit." <laughs> I know that's that's the hard part when like, you're like, "Ah, oh, did." Mm-hmm. And then the poor guy gets a base hit the next day and comes up lame, hammy and hammy and out, you know, and poor guy. Yeah, so, you know, we got Adam Engel filling in and yeah. Andrew Vaughn, who's been in a lot of trade talks lately. Mm-hmm. And I think on this day, isn't Dallas Keuchel pitching today? Probably Dallas Keuchel, yeah, because yeah, it was Velasquez yesterday. Yeah, and are you hoping for rain then today? I don't know. They play at <laughs> 6 o'clock tonight, uh, I believe 6 o'clock, first pitch. Okay. Yeah, because Jimmy Lambert's pitching tomorrow for Geo. All right, all right, sounds good. <laughs> Yeah, but exciting times. Uh, so, you know, t- typically we do chit chat a little bit about baseball, and then we move on to other things. But uh, PD had a great idea about uh, baseball and faith intersections. Yeah, so I was just thinking we a lot of us probably watch baseball. At least Pastor Warren and myself, we both watch baseball. I mean, I I watch most White Sox games or have it on. And I'm sure you kind of have most mm-hmm. Cubs games on at mm-hmm. some point. I watch the highlights. And one of the things I was thinking about is the catcher and the pitcher and that relationship that they have. Mm. Because the catcher kind of dictates the pace of the game and what pitches the pitchers are going to throw. Right, right. And that's why they typically make great managers because they're used to all that scouting. Mm -hmm. And so, and the pitcher has one of two options. Agree with what the catcher says or shake him off till he gets a call that he wants for a pitch. Yeah, because ultimately he's the one holding the ball. And ain't nothing going to happen until he decides that I'm going to throw what I want to throw. And right. so you're right. There is there is that good relationship. Like a, there is a trust built between a pitcher and a catcher. And even on a shakeoff, it doesn't mean that, you know, that there's lack of trust. It's just a different um, idea right. in that moment. And, you know, no, not everybody's a Mark Burley who just whatever, you know, hand sign was thrown down. Mm-hmm. He just said, yep. And I think I've heard him talk where he's just like, yeah, why would I say no to what the catcher's throwing? Yeah. That reminds me of that movie Bull Durham where, you know, <laughs> I can't think of the, the, the big picture. Duke? is it, No, Nuke. 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 Yeah. When L- LaLouche or something. <laughs> Nuke LaLouche is like, Nuke, just nod your head and throw whatever the catcher tells you. And then like after he got like lit up 
And then finally, every pitch was like, they really show him nodding every time. Like, all right, I will throw what my catcher says. Yes. So, Abby Calvin Nuke Lelouch. Nuke Lelouch. Was listening to Lawrence Ka- Crash Davis, mm-hmm. one Kevin Costner. Yeah. What a what an iconic film for baseball. I love when they're just talking about what they're what they're getting for the wedding presents, yeah. <laughs> the mound, right. and like so and so's got a curse on his pants. <laughs> oh, what a great baseball movie! Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so funny. I mean that that just as an aside, my mom always asked me like, "What do you guys talk about on the mound?" I go, "Mom, look at Bull Durham, <laughs> <laughs> just shooting the breeze, you know, with one another." Yeah, exactly. But how this intersects with our faith, though, yeah. is the whole idea that, like, God has a plan, and he gives us kind of plans or signs of what we should do, mm-hmm. and we either say, yes, Lord, and I'm going to follow your sign, right? or no, I think I know better than you, God, so I'm going to do my own thing. Mm. And just like in baseball, when the pitcher maybe says, hey, this is what I want, he throws maybe a hanging curveball. And that gets hit really, really far. Yeah, yeah. Well, and people, as they walk through life, very often, you know, faith-oriented people are looking to the Lord for a sign in their life, like uh, through a particular season or uh, situation, a decision. You know, I think we've all kind of asked the Lord, Lord, just give me a sign. Right. You know, and... uh you know, maybe the good Lord's, you know, doing the whole third base sign thing. You know, that's a whole nother thing. Like, See, and this is why we need a video in here for this, because P. Dubs was doing all the motions there. Yeah. Oh, that's... Uh, when I was coaching, that that was the funnest part, is just doing all those gyrations. <laughs> and, like, 99% of what you do means nothing. And there's this one thing that means something. And if I do one thing, that means everything's off. Off. Yeah, yeah, wipe it off. But, um, yeah, so I, I think people are always looking for the Lord's guidance through some kind of sign, you know, and uh, Lord, help me to see, I guess, yeah. is like to see clearly what what you want, where you want me to go, you know, right. in this decision. And kind of like we were talking before we started recording, like it seems more recent history in baseball where catchers now are painting their fingernails mm. to make it more clear to the pitcher of what they're throwing down. Or even, I think we talked on one of the last podcasts, or maybe it was just a side conversation we had about the new thing that they're doing, the pitch com mm, yeah. in Major League Baseball. I think a lot of the White Sox pitchers are using it, where they have a little like keypad that catchers on their like wristband, mm-hmm. and it sends a transmission to the pitcher, and he hears in whatever language he wants what pitch the catcher's calling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really something, the whole... Um as you were describing that, I'm thinking, well, how how is the pitcher going to, like, shake it off or, you know, keep shaking it off till he gets to something? Because, like, is he going to just do what he normally does? And, you know, no, no. Uh, and when I got to college, I uh, our pitching coach had a – he goes, you know, no more are we going to do this head shaking. He goes, we're going to – if you move your mitt on your upper body, you know, once, that means if I flashed you a one, if I do it once, that means – I'm throwing a number two sign, which is usually fastball one, curve is two, three, change. So if you were to give me a one and I swipe my jersey twice, that means I'm throwing a change up. Mm. And then like on location, uh, if the catcher wants an inside pitch and you want to go outside, let's say the the batter is a right-hander. And uh, so I will swipe the opposite leg of of my my body to say uh, I'll I'll swipe my left leg to say I want to go to the outside and so the, those were some interesting ways that it maybe a not complicated every, yeah we, we had to kind of think about that a little bit but I mean uh, ultimately probably somebody will pick up that sign but right. as opposed to nodding and shaking you know right. so that's just what that pitching coach wanted and uh, but he always said because here's the other thing. Uh, you're talking about major leagues, you know, in the, in the lower leagues, who's actually making the pitching call most mm-hmm. times is the coach in the dugout. Mm-hmm. He's flashing a sign to the catcher. The catcher is relaying a boom. And, uh, and so in the, young, in the lower leagues, especially in college, if you shake off 
and oh. you get tagged, you don't have to answer to your catcher. You got to answer to your coach, and nobody wants to do that. No. So, like, uh, my pitching coach, my freshman year in college at SIU Carbondale, he's like, "Yeah, you can shake off." Uh, he goes, "But if it don't go well for you." We're going to have a talking in the dugout. And he was like this southern drawl guy. And I'm like, oh, boy. I don't want to. Greeny was his. That was his nickname. Greeny. Like, nobody wants to talk to Greeny after <laughs> you get tagged. Especially if he shook off a pitch. Right. So. Um, yeah. You don't want to not listen to the coach. Because that happened to a White Sox pitcher late 2000s. Because they hit A.J. Pruszynski in t- uh, Texas. Mm-hmm. And they, this kid was like first or second game up from the minor leagues. And Guillen told him hit the next batter to get through it twice behind the hitter, never hit the guy. Mm. And when that kid got into the dugout, Ozzy lit him up and the kid was like in tears. And I think he got demoted like the next day. Wow. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, back to scripture, we even see in scripture where uh, people are asking the Lord for signs, right? I mean, uh, Gideon. Right. Think of Gideon, like he's like... Uh, wants, is it the fleece wet first? Yeah, he wants the fleece wet and the ground dry to indicate if he is to move forward to go and conquer these people. Midianites. Yeah, and so he wakes up the next day, and there it is. The fleece is wet, ground is dry. Wow, that's a pretty good sign. And so he's like every one of us. He's like, well... All right, God, you know, please pardon me. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about me. Uh, Can you make the ground wet and the fleece dry tomorrow morning? And then I'll know this sign is from you. And, you know, can you imagine God just like shaking his head up in heaven going, oh boy. Well, even like Moses with like, how I can't go to Pharaoh. Yeah. And he's like, I can't speak. Well, here's your answer. Here's the, okay, turn, throw your stick down. Mm. It became a snake and all Mm -hmm. those things. Yeah, and uh, so just that people, they just, they get the clear sign, but yet there's some doubt. I got to make sure this is before I can commit. And uh, more times, I think that's just a lesson for us that, you know, we're trying to rely on ourselves to make sure that we're good with the sign right. and the direction rather than trusting our our catcher, God, right. with the, the captain who's overseeing the whole playing field because that's that's the job of the catcher. He sees everything in front of him. And so, like, if you ever see other signs that the catchers give, they'll sometimes step out in front of home plate and do, like, a third baseman right. coach sign. And he's he's telling the infielders what to do on a particular play, you know, ground ball or this or that, and trying to position people. Um so if we don't like look at our catcher in this metaphor of you know God, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get lit up, right? Sometimes I mean that's a possibility. I mean pitchers sometimes get lucky when they mm-hmm. shake off and uh, and they make a good choice and it works against the hitter, uh, but there are times um, not so good. Not so good. <laughs> I mean, you get whiplash like right. Nuke Lelouch. We get whiplash <laughs> watching that ball go out of the yard, you right. know. So, yeah, those signs are always maybe not easy to pick up as we were talking about. And so, like, I was starting to think as you were talking about that, what about, like, when you went to Cambodia, were there signs where you're like, God, are you really sure you want me to go to Cambodia? Mm. Yeah, uh, because if I remember right, there was a lot going on uh like personally like roadblocks that were coming up and and one of the roadblocks cuz we went in the spring one of the roadblocks was taxes and I was trying to work my taxes and get them done in time and I was in a position where I can't remember what the situation but I was waiting on information to come to me at at the the right moment so I could complete my taxes um and I was like, well, what am I going to do if this information comes while I'm in Cambodia? Nobody will know what to do because I'm doing my own taxes. I'm going to be late. You know, I'm thinking, oh, this is. And so there was that roadblock. And then there was a health roadblock of maybe someone in my family at the time. And I kept thinking, am I supposed to go, Lord? Are these signs that I'm not 
supposed to go? And I was really struggling with that. And I, I just kept praying. And, uh, well, the tax thing came at the 11th hour, and I got it, the information. I got it done. Whew, big relief. And uh, the health thing, I think I knew enough that it was stable and uh, that my being around wasn't necessary. So right. I just took that as like, okay, the Lord is, is giving me signs to say the road is clear. Right, because, I mean, I remember, like, because that was like when I first started here at Emmanuel. Before I even got installed, I got an email from George yeah. saying, hey, you know, we got this trip to Cambodia coming up in like May, mm-hmm. and Pastor Warren's planning to go, but if something happens and he can't go, would you be willing to go? Yeah. And I was like, I haven't even officially started, <laughs> yeah. and I'm getting asked to go on a trip to Cambodia. I'm right, like, right. what is this? I know. And so, but yeah, those signs, because even when I went then the following year, I was like... Are you sure, God? Mm-hmm. Are you really sure you want me to go this far away? Yeah, this is like all across the world. And I've never done anything like this before. And uh, and so God paves the way every time. And uh, I guess that's the thing is like obedience, right? If, mm-hmm. if the Lord is calling us to a place, um, I think Satan's going to put up all the roadblocks and maybe even our own sinful self will find mm-hmm. roadblocks. And uh, if we trust in him... He'll, he'll open the pathway for us, and it might not just be evident right away. It may take a few steps. Right. No, we need to be more like Mark Burley, just say, when God puts on that sign, mm-hmm. yep, that's what I'm going to do. Right. But that's easier said than done, because like you said, we put up roadblocks, and maybe we create these roadblocks like, eh, God really isn't saying this. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's other things, like in baseball, you know, the whole stealing of signs, you mm-hmm. know, and... Uh, so I think sometimes I wonder in our faith if we're really looking in different places, in the wrong places, for a sign from God and thinking, oh, this must be a sign from him because I'm really looking hard in this place or that place when we're really not looking in his word, we're not looking in like in prayer. Um, you know, kind of like baseball, I was describing to you, uh, a hitter when I was in college was instructed while the pitcher was getting the sign to kind of peek down at the catcher to see what numbers he was putting down. And uh, that way he'd gain an advantage, like, oh, I see the catcher putting number one, fastball's coming, I'm ready for a fastball. That's a big advantage. Right. Um, But the catcher also was instructed to look up at the batter before he gave his sign. So, like... If you're peeking down and you see the catcher looking up at you, that's an interesting exchange in that moment. Like busted. You Did know? you ever have that exchange? I've I've had it where I look down and the catcher's looking up at me and he's just he keeps looking up at me and he's like not gonna do anything until I stop looking at him. And it's like a face off. <laughs> so um, you know, and so there's that. There's um Or you can misinterpret a sign. Absolutely. Uh, like a runner at second base mm-hmm. trying, he sees the number, the digits, right? Even if the nails are polished or not, he's like, okay, there's a, he's wiggling all of his fingers. Wiggling your fingers is usually a change up. So if I see that and I'm like, I got to somehow communicate to my batter that there's a change up coming, maybe the batter might interpret it wrong. And I've had that happen mm. where my batter thought I said one thing. And he's, it became something else. And he's like, why'd you tell me it was a fastball? I said, I, it was a changeup. I said, no, dude, I was giving you the changeup right. sign. No, oh, I saw you say fastball. And so, like, that gets us at odds with one another on the same team. Right. So there's Satan. Like, if we're looking in the wrong places for signs, maybe that gets us at odds with our neighbor as we're working through situations. Right, I don't know. Maybe I'm reaching. But. but I don't know. But as you were saying that, I was saying how the devil wants to see us divided and not, mm-hmm. not united because he knows that if we're divided and we're on our own, we're much easier to attack. And so that's kind of what they're And you see that in sports. Like when teams are divided, they're not as successful. Like I know I heard, thought I saw something in the last week about the Cubs saying how, like, how, what a bad locker room it was last year. Mm. And that like... No, that's why they had a rough season. Yeah, yeah. And you look at this year, granted, we're four games in, but they're playing pretty well. So far, so good. And it's not like they really changed the roster Mm -mm. all that much. You got Suzuki, 
But other than that, you still have a lot of the same players, and it's a better locker room. And look what's happening this season yeah. in a small, very small sample size. For sure. And you saw a little bit of that even after the big-name players left. There was a, a little difference in the chemistry of the group. Well, you, when you got a Frank Schwindel. Oh, my goodness. He's the glue that holds that team together. Patrick Wisdom. And, you know, you're trying to combine those two names to, you know, say what a what a match they are. You know, like the Brizzo thing. They were coming up with... Uh, Schwisdom and you know stuff like that, <laughs> not, or, or Wendell or, or whatever. I did not hear neither because I don't have Marquee. Yeah, well, they were doing a whole lot of that at the end of the last year, and it was like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of cheesy. Well, I force it <laughs> exactly, but um, yeah. So and sometimes, um, the Lord uh, encourages us to ask for a sign to um, maybe elicit some faith. You know, like, let's say a pitcher, you know, if he's getting hammered out there left and right, maybe he's like, come on, you know, catch, give me a good sign, you know, sure. come on. You, and and um, yeah, I need a little help. Well, in Isaiah 7, 10, uh, you know, King Ahaz really wasn't walking with the Lord. He was kind of all about himself. And the Lord spoke directly to Ahaz and he says, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. And then almost like, oh, sarcastically, Ahaz says, oh, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And and he said, here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And then uh, the sign here is, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. So it's like Ahaz was like, oh, Lord, no, I, I can't ask you for a sign. And it's like almost a kind of an ironic lack of faith. And then, well, God says, all right, if you're not going to ask me, I'll give you a sign, you know, and let's see what you think about that, you know. So sometimes in our lives, you know, maybe the Lord is working in us to ask him, because right. when we ask, we're relying more. And right. and here he tells Ahaz, go as deep as Sheol or as high as the heaven. Let your request be whatever it needs to be. Ask me. I'll right. give it to you. And sometimes it is in that whisper. And I think, like, I like that mm. Bible study we did a few years ago on, like, a Saturday because we had just the one service, like, Reformation. Yeah where I think it was Mark Battison and like the whisper maker or something and how he talked about a whisper draws you closer. Right. And I've always liked that illustration. Maybe that's what God's trying to do with some of those signs, just like as a catcher or pitcher in a tense situation Mm -hmm. when they don't want anybody knowing what's going on. Right. They do a mound visit. It's exactly. I I was thinking as you were just saying there. That's that's what sometimes you just call time out. Right, and then you got to talk have, it over, and you got to have your glove in front of your mouth so <laughs> yeah. nobody can see what you're saying. Yeah, I know. Well, I never had to worry about that. I was never really on TV, so mm-hmm. or you know, but you know, Vin Scully, boy, you know, there's a there's a Dodgers, right? Yeah, he was the announcer for the Dodgers. He was Mr. Lip Reader. Was he? Oh, man. If you ever listen to any of his broadcasts, and like, especially with Tommy Lasorda, who was a very colorful, oh, yes. you know, and he'd be in the dugout spewing words. And like Vin Scully would say, and Tommy Lasorda looks pretty upset. And he said this, I believe. And like, <laughs> I don't know, Vin, maybe yeah. you better hold back on, you know, what he's saying. Well, that was like, you know, the lip reading. I don't know if you saw, is it Alec Brom or something on the Phillies? Mm. They got a nice, well, he didn't say such a nice thing okay. that they lip read what he said. Okay. Because he had like three airs in this one inning or something. And he plays in Philly and it was in Philadelphia. Oh, boy. And you know how lovely the Philadelphia fans are. Yeah. And he said something to the extent of he doesn't like this place. Oh, boy. With some other words added oh, in there. Oh, boy. And you could clearly read his mouth. Wow. And after the game, you know, he could have tried to say, oh, you know, I don't, he could have tried to explain like, oh, I said I didn't like this position or yeah. I, we need to get out of this position. Mm-hmm. But he's like, you know what? I said it. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. You know, it was in the heat of the moment. I love you guys as fans. Mm. But that's the last place where you want to bad mouth fans. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people watching him. And, right. and you know, maybe even us as Christians, you know, are there people watching you and I? Um, not just you, Pastor, and me, Pastor, but all of us collectively 
who know that we're people of faith. And so if we're, I think they are watching us as we go through difficult, challenging times. And how are we leaning into our faith, asking God for a sign, being obedient to his direction, you know, right. following him, uh, not paying lip service to him, you know, that right. kind of thing. And, um, and, and God does things with that. Like, uh, I think if, if we're faithful to God and lean into him and really trust in the signs that he gives us, I think that works on people who watch this from a distance. Like, oh, yeah, they kind of say, okay, I got to see what's going on there. Yeah. And even as you were going, I was thinking of the whole, you know, we're talking about the signs and, like, how you can shake off the catcher if you want. Mm. But even, like, if you follow the catcher's guy, if he says throw a curveball, throw a knuckleball, throw whatever, Mm -hmm. and you throw it and it still gets lit up, it gets drilled, you know, that I think is, like, our sinful nature. There's times where we say, okay, I see what God's setting in front of me, but sometimes even when we do that, we make a mistake because of our sinful human nature, and it kind of blows up in our face just as when you maybe hang a curveball when the well, catcher... Well, yeah, you just get to a really good point here in baseball. Like, you could be obedient like Nuke Lelouch finally was, but you if you don't hit the, the location, which I talked about earlier, but you throw the right pitch, then you didn't execute properly. And that reminds me of my high school days when I was at Frem High School and playing our rivals, Palatine Pirates, and it was Whoa. over at their park. And, uh, boy, the wind was blowing. The wind was blowing. i got to get this right now. The wind was blowing out, okay? okay? So as I pitch, the wind is blowing against me. So I, I wasn't like a lightning fast, th- you know, fastball oh. thrower. I relied on a lot of movement. So I was using my fork ball, which was slower, and it would dip. But if it didn't dip, you were in trouble, potentially. So I'm striking them out on on my fork ball, my curve ball, and the Palatine guys are in the dugout. They're calling me, oh, look at this rag arm. He can't throw more than 65 miles an hour. Look at him. And I'm like, go ahead, keep yelling at me. I'm, I'm getting you guys out. Well, I get the pitch. Give me the, the, the fork ball. I throw it up. It hangs. And the guy promptly parks it over center field. And then the whole Palatine Pirate dugout. Now, I knew most of these guys, so... There was, a, there was a good friendship, but rivalry going right. on. And they're like, you hang them, we bang them, you <laughs> hang them, we bang them all. As, I mean, they're chanting that. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get you guys, you know. <laughs> so uh, I'll never, ever forget that. But, um, yeah, they were relentless. I mean, right. they would just like, we, we had a good rivalry friend in Palatine back in the day. Hmm. So, yeah, I didn't get the location. I got the sign right. I didn't get the location, kind of right. where you were going at, right. and uh, that I didn't execute on it. Right. So, you know, we, we still can have that. God sets it. We follow. But our sinfulness, our human nature. We might tweak it a little, or we're right. off mark, right? right? And Isn't that what sin is? We miss the mark. Miss the mark. Wait, mm-hmm. Good job there. Hey, I was thinking, you know, that's what uh, Mr. Saunders says in the school. Yeah. And so, I don't know, I think we're kind of getting up to the time here. But, yeah. But maybe the next time you watch a baseball game, this conversation will resonate or you think about this and think about your own life and the signs that God has given to you. And so, you know, that's how faith intersects when you can watch a baseball game. There's 162 of them for your favorite team every year and more if they make it into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm so glad you brought this up, PD. It was a fun topic to kick around and hope everybody enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.